So hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Rizard and uh, today we are going to talk about Escape Dios and the developments and achievements we have been doing in this work package in the Escape project. This presentation will be presented along with my colleague Ricardo. Next slide, please. So what is Escape? Escape is a EU funded project and uh, it has three main goals. The first one is to prototype an infrastructure that is adapted to the exabyte scale future needs for large science projects. The second one is to drive the development of EOSC, of European Open Science Cloud. And finally, we want to address the fair data management principles. Uh, you can see on the left, the science projects that participate in ESCAPE and our partners also on the right. Next slide, please. So in DIOS, we, the main contribution is the deployment of the data lake, what we call a data lake. So what is a data lake for us? It's a federated data infrastructure. It uh, has multiple storage and protocol technologies. Uh, these are mainly from the HEP community technologies, WLCG, but uh, we also integrate uh, industry technologies. Uh, and uh, it supports uh, uh, QoS and file transitions, uh, transitions, distributed redundancy and data policies. Um, you can see on the left, the architecture of the data lake, and I'm going to go through that. Um, so in the middle, you can see the Rusio instance we have, the Rusio server. Rusio is our data orchestrator. It's a policy driven data management tool, which allows us to have uh, all the goodies of data policies and replication and so on. We use FTS as the middleware to transfer large, um, to transfer uh, a lot of data reliably over the grid. And we have GFile2 as our grid file access library. This is the library that actually uh, talks to the storage and does the uh, copies that we need. Uh, you can see that we use uh, Creek. Creek is our information catalog. Uh, Creek is connected to Rusio, so there is an auto configuration step where the users, the storage providers, as you can see, they configure their storages and then uh, put this input to Creek, and from Creek this gets propagated to the Rusio uh, system. On the bottom right, you can see the storages. So we support EOS, DPM, Dcash, Storm, XRD, and some other storages, uh, and all this is connected uh, via Rusio. We have the Indigo EM. This is our identity and access management service. And uh, through that, the users can authenticate and authorize their actions to our instance. We have deployed Rusio with Kubernetes and OpenStack and CERN. And um, we use Oracle DB as our backend for Rusio. Uh, we also have two more components, uh, the testing infrastructure and the monitoring infrastructure, which serves as the, as the, as the means for us to test that our uh, services are working properly, that the traffic is correct, and that uh, we have everything functioning. And the monitoring infrastructure where we monitor everything in our system, how users interact with it, uh, if the file transfers are successful or not, and the other issues that might occur. And finally, uh, we participate in the Open, Ice, Open Science Grid and WCG network of perso personal boxes. This is, uh, offers us uh, network testing capabilities so we can see from each storage endpoint to the other ones, what is the latency, the bandwidth, uh, and so on. So this is what we call the data lake in this, uh, in this architecture that you can see here. And now I leave the floor to Ricardo to explain the rest. Hello to everyone. I'm uh, Ricardo, I'm the task lead of the data lake. So basically what uh, Richard uh, presented uh, uh, up to now uh, within DIOS. Uh, I'm gonna give you an overview about the product we develop, uh, design and develop lately uh, within DIOS. Next, please. This is called a data lake as a service for open science. The goal is to make uh, the end user comfortable 
the experience of embarking on a data lake on the data lake comfortable enough for for every everyone so from the scientist to whoever is interested in um, in exploring the data lake so abstracting the complexity of the data lake from them so they can focus on doing science in that instead of uh, data procurement nowadays uh, an ever increasing number of experiments are looking at the, the Rusho data management system and uh, we believe that data lake as a service is potentially interesting for both aficionados and newcomer of this uh, uh, data management system. So here you can see where the data lake as a service sits. It's really between the science, uh, science and uh, the uh, our orchestrator that is uh, that is Rusho. Next, please. Next, thanks. So. Uh, the, the scene is you have uh, several storages around the globe were distributed worldwide. You have, the, you have a service, both uh, Data Lake as a service and the Rusho instance at, uh, at CERN. And you have a user, for example, in, uh, in Indonesia that wants to access the data. Next, please. So you can contact uh, uh, Data Lake as a service. Uh, it's uh, the URL is called escape notebook. Uh, at CERN.ch, the requests are handled by the Jupyter server at CERN in Geneva. Uh, the authentication uh, uh, is via IAM, that is our identity provider, hosted at CNAF, using OpenID Connect uh, by default, uh, but it supports also X509. And you, um, you'll be prompt with uh, a set of uh, experiment specific environments that we let our sciences to, um, to provide us with so that they can have their own, uh, um, the, the, their own specifics, specification of uh, environment packages and so on loaded directly in their uh, session, in the, their notebook session. Next, please. So, what are the use cases uh, of uh, that that the data lake as a service can cover? Uh, first of all, is data browsing or dis discovery of uh, of the data, and uh, the data access. So you you you'll have uh, this integration of Rusho directly in, in your notebook, in the explore um, in the explore box. You can. Um, Use also wildcard to inspect uh, uh, inspect your data. You have a search filtering capability for file, for data set, and for containers. And uh, you'll be prompt with uh, uh, all the types of uh, of data that are hosted in our in our data lake. In this case, you have the possibility to link to other um, to other instances as well. But this is specifically for the data lake. And you have also, for example, a feature a functionality to retrieve uh, the physical file name of the file hosted um, hosted in the data lake. Next one, please. Um, the there is a feature of functionality to make the data available in the user space. We have mounted uh, one store. We have a storage backend that is also known by Rusho. So for the end user, this uh, uh, this means inspecting data that as uh, they were local. And we cover uh, use cases such as data pre preparation and data preservation, where do you produce output of a uh, um, of an analysis directly, like plots, uh, or uh, a mid-stage of an analysis, such as uh, skimming uh, uh, data and producing uh, another format uh, of data that should be used by other analysts. We have, uh, we have the functionality of uh, uploading back uh, the data to the lake using both, uh, um, covering both uh, uh, small size files as well as a uh, large one. Next one. Uh, we also integrate uh, uh, content delivery and, lat and latency hiding uh, layer, uh, specifically uh, Xcache XRD technology. Uh, so you can uh, you can retrieve your data, and this will be uh, once you access those data, this those will be cached in a um, in a caching layer we have uh, put on uh, a prompt in uh, in our in our deployment. So in this case. Uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm showing the redirector for this cache we have uh, hosted at CERN. Next, please. So what what we achieved uh, up to now? Escape managed to pilot and prototype uh, uh, data lake infrastructure. This is fulfilling the functional data management needs of uh, flagship uh, Ansfri from several scientific disciplines. We successfully tested uh, the data lake 
both in 2020 and 2021, naming code is uh, FDR and, uh, and DAC, you have the link there and uh, you're more than welcome to, uh, to, to have a look at them because uh, there's quite some uh, interesting results from all the sciences that participated in it. Uh, we prove a sensible uh, choice uh, of technology coming from WCG um, environment LHC experiment. We, uh, we create uh, momentum with respect to community engagement and contribution from a different kind of sciences and, uh, and communities from astroparticle physics, electromagnetic and gravitational wave, uh, particle physics, but also nuclear physics. All of, all of us are pursuing together the fair and open access data principle. We established collaboration with other communities, other uh, EU funded projects, for example, PANOS expand the CS3 mesh for EOSC and the EOSC future that will be uh, the future step, let's say we're uh, taking the legacy uh, of escape. And uh, we also have this product uh, that I just present that I like as a service that hides the complexity of uh, the data lake uh, from uh, the end user. Escape ends this year, so we are addressing now the long-term sustainability, and this uh, reconnects with uh, the, to the collaboration we have established with other projects. I think now it's important you hear uh, from, from the science themselves, so I'll uh, mute myself and we can go on, and I'll let you to answer your question uh, at the end of the, of, uh, the workshop. Hello, everybody. I'm Mika Bauhaus. I will talk to you about data processing and data management for the neutrino telescope, in particular for the KM3 net neutrino telescope. If you would move to the next slide. So, the KM3 neutrino telescope is a distributed infrastructure which is uh, operational at two sites one in Italy, one in France, in the Mediterranean Sea. So, the detector in Italy will eventually be. Uh, have a size of one Q kilometer and the one in France a little bit uh, smaller. This is due to the uh, science that both these uh, instruments are doing. So this is a modular telescope array, which means that we it consists of modules. So uh, as you see in the picture on the left, strings anchored to the seabed and help, held uh, vertically upright by a buoy. Um, in the end, there will be 345 vertical strings and as you see, these strings consist of um, detection modules, one of which is expanded all the way on the left. These are modules that contain light sensitive photomultiplier tubes and with 345 strings in the end and uh, in each string, 18 of these modules, we will have a total of 200,000 of these photomultiplier tubes. As I said, this is a modular telescope array. So we are building, we are deploying and at the moment, uh, the, the French detector is uh, for 10% operational now and the Italian for 5%. If you move to the next slide, thank you. Yes, to explain the data management and the data processing in this telescope, I need to explain a little bit about the, the detection principle and the data rates. So um, what we detect is the track of light that is produced by relativistic particles that uh, propagate through the water. And this uh, track of light that they produce is uh, detected by the photomultiplier tubes in these detection mo modules that you see expanded again. And these uh, photomultiplier tubes, they uh, detect this light at the quantum level. And then what they do is they timestamp every photon. And that is the information that is sent to shore. So although is the detector is on the bottom of the sea at a depth of two and a half or three and a half kilometers, depending on the site, um, there's still a lot of light and these photomultiply tubes are really, really very sensitive, so they still detect a lot of light. Uh, the PMT singles rate is 10 kilohertz, so every second they detect, every PMT detects 10,000 photons, um, which are recorded and, and sent to shore. So if you take into account the, the 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 size of a time-stamped photon in, in bytes, and translated to what it means for a complete string consisting of 18 of these modules. Um, this comes to a data rate, output rate of 300 megabits per second for one string. So for the pool detector, in the end, we will have 100 gigabits per second coming out of the detector. And this, all these data are uh, sent to shore. So there's no 
uh, offshore data filtering or data compression of that of any kind. So everything is sent to shore. So that is the detection of the light. If you move on to the next slide, I have indicated here the KM3 net computing model in different uh, layers. So you have the tier zero data layer where um, you have the data acquisition, as I just explained, so the detection of the light by the photomultiplier tubes, all sent to shore by a single cable. As I said, there's two sides, French and Italian, left and right. Um, all these data come together in a shore station where they are processed, which I will explain in a later slide. Anyhow, what comes out of these shore stations is moved on to the tier one level, the data storage and data processing level. So all of these data are stored in what we think is a safe place and also backed up to a second place. So all the data are duplicated and available um, for a long time, because this is all the data that we have left to do our anal analyses on. Uh, as a second step in this tier one layer is the data processing. So all of these uh, data have to be uh, processed in some way to prepare them for the higher level analyses, which is the tier two level, the, the top level, the data analyses will take place in local computing resources usually. And uh, so this completes the computing model of game three net in a nutshell. And if you move on to the next slide, what we have done that deals uh, infrastructure just um, uh, described by Richard and, and Ricardo, we have been trying to, uh, to investigate how this infrastructure can be used in all of the layers of the KM3Net um, computing model. So I, each of these steps I will explain in the next slide. So if you move on to the next slide, the first thing I'm going to explain to you how the deals has been applied to the tier zero data level data layer of KM3Net. So as I said, you have um, all data to shore, then you have a shore station where all the data arrive. And uh, what happens is that in the shore station, we have a, 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 a batch system or a computer system, all, all running software and they have algorithms implemented. And what they do, they find causalities between the timestamp data. So based on the arrival time of the photons and also the 3D positions of the photomultiplier tubes. So they try to find correlations and every time they find hits or uh, detected photons, the time sent photons that could be caused by a particle traversing the detector, they say, okay, this is an event. This is a particle that could be a neutrino. And this is how they filter out events. So our, uh, our all uh, steps that come after, after this filter step are uh, applied to events. So event is no more than just a particle uh, crossing the detector. The event rate on the, at this step is 200 hertz, so we find 200 particles every second crossing the detector, and the reduction factor at this point is uh, 10 to the fourth. So that the 100 megabits per second eventually will be reduced by a factor of 10 to the fourth, and that is all the data that we have available for the for the physics analyses. Now this DEOS handles the data storage of these filtered events, so it means that in when you inject these data into this infrastructure it knows from the data level where they need to go. So as I said, we want these to be on a safe storage that is all handled internally in this, in this infrastructure based on the data level. So there's no need to specify uh, what exact, where the data exactly have to go, but it just knows this from the data level that you, um, that, that, that are um, tagged to the data that are coming out of this compute system. Um, and the other thing is that, as I said, we also, we copy the data to a second uh, computer center just to, to be safe and have the data available at two places. That is also not have to be done anymore um, specifically. That is also handled under the hood by this infrastructure. So it knows we, when we have this data, they have to go in the first place to a safe storage environment and also copy, replicate it to another site to have a backup. So this is where this, um, uh, infrastructure plays a very powerful role. If we go to the next slide, I can show you how this deals infrastructure is applied to the tier one uh, data layer. All of the events, so we have now filtered events that need to be calibrated, need to be reconstructed as we call it, to be prepared for the analyses. 
So all this calibration and reconstruction involves a number of steps. For example, first you start with the calibration. There's lots and lots of things that need to be calibrated. So for example, the PMT quantum efficiency, the PMT gains, they need to be calibrated. You have the strings moving in the water due to the currents. You have the uh, detection modules that are ro uh, uh, rotating. All these things you have to calibrate. So then you have from filter events, you go to calibrated events. Then you want to reconstruct your events, which means, as I said, the, the, what we're getting out of the detector are just events, just things crossing the detector, but it doesn't mean they're neutrinos, they're neutrino candidates. So at some point after the calibration, we need to decide, are these neutrinos or not? So we're going to apply um, some fits to the data, which determine uh, the neutrino type. So be, depending on which type of particle you're looking at, it has a different signature in the detector. So that's what this step does. You have to uh, reconstruct the neutrino direction because in the end we want to do um, neutrino astronomy. So look at the sky, which are the neutrino sources. So you have to be able to say where it came from exactly. And also the neutrino energy, which is based on the amount of light that it produces in the, in the detector. So you have the filtered events are calibrated and then reconstructed just saying, is this a neutrino or not? So in all of these steps, the calibration and reconstruction are all input to the analysis. So all of these steps need to be applied to each of these events um to to do your follow-up uh, analysis and where this um deals into in, uh, infrastructure plays a role is that it handles the storage of these calibrated and reconstructed data so in the first place as uh, richard has explained this infrastructure is just a collection of storage elements across all of europe or even more if you like and uh, with this um community of a uh, uh, international partners in KF3, and this is very convenient because if you have access to this in, uh, infrastructure, then you have access to all the all of these storage elements wherever they are. So you don't, for example, don't need access to every individual compute center, but you can just via this interface uh, access all of these um, storage elements. That's the first thing, and also um, you can choose where uh, depending on which storage element you have uh, stored your data where the data processing is going to take place so you can have a more efficient way of um, distributing your uh, data processing over the different um, computer centers and the other thing is as i said i so there's a very um, um, sophisticated way of organizing your data in brucio um, depending on uh, labels that you can attach to to your data so as i try to uh, indicate with the color coding, you have the raw events which needs to be calibrated, all the calibration steps, all the reconstruction steps, and in the end need to end up as green reconstructed events. So you have a way of indicating and organizing your data in a way uh, that indicates at what step of the data processing you are. If we move on to the next slide, there's an example of how we have tried to apply the DEALS infrastructure to the highest data layer, which is a tier two level where you want to do your scientific analyses. And that's what, why we're actually doing this experiment. Of course, you want to do a neutrino astronomy and multi-messenger astronomy. So what uh, Ricardo has been showing is this data lake as a service. You see a little screenshot uh, that also Ricardo showed. So this is a Jupyter notebook, uh, which contains an interface to Ruscio. So this data management tool, where on the left side, you can you can uh, browse the data in a way, your data sets, et cetera, and find data. And on the left side, you have an, uh, an integrated development environment where you can um, uh, perform uh, uh, actions on your operations on your data. So what we've been doing is um, finding calibrated and reconstructed data. So the data that have been um, approved to be used for the higher level analyses, find them via this Ruscio interface on the left side, then do some analysis on it uh, on this integrated um, development um, um, development uh, environment on the right, um, convert it to some reduced data format that is actually used inside these high level analyses and then ingest that back into the data lake. And what we have found is that this, um, this is a actually very user friendly uh, interface to the data lake. So it's very easy to, to browse these data and find the data back. Also the organization, organization and data sets again you can label and organize your data in a way that uh, you have uh, the separation for the different uh, groups of people doing a certain analysis and stages of these analysis that this, these analyses are at, et cetera, which is very, very nicely uh, implemented. 
and also it has this integrated development environment as i said as, so you can um, uh, directly apply some operations on the data that you're getting from the left side from this data lake so if we move on to the next slide which are the conclusions so i would like to conclude to say that the game 3 net neutrino telescope is indeed under construction however we're, we're already building and deploying deploying so we're also operating we have a small detector in, in france and italy operational at the moment they're operating uh 24 7. so as a result of course we're also active in all the uh, data processing and, and and data analyses so in all layers of the of the computing model we have different types of data processing, different data levels, as I have explained. And once the telescope will be ready, uh, it will, so it's ready already, but if it's ready, we will take data for another at least 15 years. And even after that, when we stop data taking, it will, we have to have a, uh, a solution for our data management for at least another 10 years to finalize the, the analyses. So we need a, a sustainable solution for the data management for the next 50 to 20 years. So, and we have demonstrated with this deals infrastructure that uh, this is very powerful for the different uh, um, data layers in K3Net. And this is very nicely applicable to all of our data processing and data management. So in fact, K3Net is now adopting this deals like infrastructure to make it available to our experiment. And this is where I would like to end my presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I am based in Lyon and I work for uh, I2P3 CNRS uh, in France. Uh, so next slide. So the LSST uh, acronym stands for a, a Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And uh, this survey will be perform use the, the instruments in the Rubin Observatory. So the goal of, of, the, of the project, the end goal is to, to uh, deliver a catalog of uh, 20 billion galaxies and 17 billion stars. And uh, each one of those uh, uh, astronomical objects uh, annotated with uh, their uh, detected physical properties. So, so we have, uh, telescope uh, and a camera that will produce uh, raw images. And uh, from those raw images, we will deliver three kinds of products. So first kind of products are the alerts, uh, which will be delivered every night. Uh, and images and catalogs, which will be delivered once per year. And those products uh, will be used by several science collaborations uh, for doing their uh, particular studies. So next slide. So there are several ingredients that uh, we will be using for, for, uh, uh, for this purpose. Uh, the first one is the observatory, which is located in the Chilean Andes. Um, uh, so you see a rendering of the, of the location then the, you need the telescope, uh, which is an uh, um, eight uh, meter telescope, uh, very compact and agile so that we can move it uh, uh, every night to, to collect the, the sky images that what we want to collect. And then of course, the, the camera, which is a wonderful instrument, uh, will deliver uh, 3.2 uh, gigapixels uh, camera. And uh, that is wonderful, but that poses also problems in terms of, of, of uh, data management. So the next slide shows um, a real photo, a recent photo of, of the uh, observatory, which is still in construction. It's in the fi final phase of uh, construction. So you uh, compare the size of the cars in the photos, you see the, uh, the size of the uh, of the site. Uh, so in the next slide, we uh, illustrate the fact that uh, um, the survey will cover uh, almost half of the sky and will scan systematically uh, the southern uh, uh, sky uh, every, uh, every night. And we will cover the observable sky every three to four nights. So uh, next slide. 
So the principle of operations of this, uh, of this project is that uh, uh, 90% of the, of the time of the telescope will be devoted to, to the survey. And uh, one complete visit of the, of the sky will be, will be achieved every three to four nights. And then that will be repeated for over 10 years, starting in 2024. So at the end of the of this 10 years operations period, each patch of the sky will be visited around 10 or oh, 1,000 times, sorry. Uh, so you will you will build a movie of, of every patch of the sky over, the, over those 10 years. And, and that, that is the first time that will be uh, done. So the data that will be collected will be used for, for different studies, science studies in, in several domains, in, in dark energy and dark matter, um, also for a study in the solar system, the transient sky, and people will be also studying our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Next slide. So in terms of, of data, the, the camera will, will produce uh, 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 2,000 science exposures per night, uh, plus calibration uh, images. And uh, each exposure is uh, six gigabyte uh, of, of data. So that will be uh, 15 terabytes uh, uh, per night over 300, 300 nights per year. Uh, so that means a lot of data that will be uh, collected and, and processed and new data will be produced over, over the 10 years period. Next slide. So the acquisition site is in, in South America in Chile that you will you see in, the, uh, in, the, in this chart, which is called the summit uh, size. Then the data is uh, transferred to California, uh, to a SLAC uh, National Laboratory, which is the archive and main center of uh, storage and processing for, uh, for LSST. And then from uh, California, we will be replicating the data to two sites in Europe, one in France and, and one in the UK. And for, uh, for this uh, data replication is that uh, we have started using the SCAPE, uh, SCAPE data link. So next slide. So we took the opportunity of, of the SCAPE data link to, to uh, get familiar with, with uh, replicating uh, LSST data. So we uh, set, up, uh, set ourselves uh, the, the goal of replicating one night of, uh, of LSST data uh, repeatedly over uh, five consecutive dates uh, using the SCAPE data leak. So we use a realistic data, data set, uh, which is uh, composed of, of 4,000 exposures. So that's two nights of exposures and, and uh, 800,000 files. So that's equivalent to one night of, of raw data in terms of volume and two nights in terms of, of number of files. Um, uh, we set ourselves the, the budget of, of replicating the data in 12 hours. Uh, that's basically the duration of the night. And we uh, uh, did the exercise uh, using the Ruscio and FTS uh, instances that were presented already. Uh, and using two uh, storage endpoints in Europe. That was uh, CERN and Time to P3 in France. So the data flow went from CERN to IM2P3. Uh, uh, th those are uh, two uh, very near sites. So the, the, the latency of all the sites is four milliseconds, which is very low. And uh, after uh, several efforts, and an exercise and try and an error, we, we managed to, at the end of the exercise, to replicate the entire data set uh, in less than eight hours and without any errors. So in the next slide, we see uh, some, some monitoring tools that uh, were set up by the by the SCAPE project so that uh, science projects can observe the activity in the storage elements uh, involved in the exercise 
and uh, and the view that uh, Ruscio provides about uh, its uh, activity. So this is a screenshot of, of the of the five uh, days exercise that we performed in last uh, November. Uh, next slide. So after uh, using the escape uh, infrastructure, uh, we started using the, uh, our own Rubin infrastructure uh, uh, for performing more realistic exercises. So we started a similar exercise, but this time using uh, the transatlantic uh, network link. So the data flow went from California, from Slack to uh, I2P3. And uh, the replication was driven uh, by Russia and FTS, but this time uh, uh, specific instances of those tools that deployed uh, by the Rubin um, project and located uh, at Slack in California. Uh, so there is an ongoing work for uh, improving the uh, uh, the transfer uh, driven by FTS, uh, in particular for identifying what are the right parameters uh, which are adequate for efficient transfer of, of high number of small files uh, and over high latency network links. So, so the problem is, is different. We are observing problems that, that we didn't observe when we used uh, the European data lake uh, provided by the scape. And uh, another um, work that, uh, that the project is doing is integrating with uh, the Butler. The Butler is the specific uh, LSST IO abstraction layer. Uh, so when you replicate the data, we, you need to make sure that, that the Butler is uh, aware of that replication. Uh, so it knows how to talk to Ruscio to, uh, to collect the, the information where the data is located. Uh, next slide. So the benefits we as a science project uh, experienced uh, using the, the escape data lake is, is uh, that it was instrumental for us for getting familiar with the data management tools and evaluating them for uh, our specific purposes. Uh, the escape provided a, a ready to use and well maintained and monitored and flexible infrastructure, and that is for sure an accelerator of adoption of those of those tools. Uh, you don't have to deploy those tools for doing your own experimentation, uh, and you can perform realistic exercise using the, the ready to use infrastructure. And in addition to the infrastructure, I think one, another uh, high benefit, uh, big benefit of, of, of Escape is that it provides a forum to share experience with other science projects uh, about the tools, about the infrastructure, and uh, as well uh, with developers and operators of those tools. Uh, you can have uh, previews of the uh, common technologies that we that uh, is going to be deployed and, and be used and what is being developed by, by, by the people developing those tools. And this is extremely valuable for preparing the future of a project like LSST. So next slide. Okay. This is my this is my my last slide. Cool. Okay. So uh, well. Uh, uh, so you could immediately start with click so that we see the title of my talk. Uh, so I I I'm actually going to to show you something about the lower uh, view on 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 all the work we did in the data lake. Click please. So I think it all starts with the science. Um, so I decided to just give a standard overview of the lower science. Yes, I can start my video. Um, and so here you basically see the whole range of the type of science that that, that we are doing with, with LOFAR. So, uh, well, obviously you wouldn't be surprised uh, given the fact that we are a telescope that we look mostly at stuff that's above our heads. So on the bottom left, you see a planet that you should probably recognize Earth. And um, as you see, we are studying several things ranging from stuff that happens in our atmosphere, in our ion ionosphere to stuff that happens in our solar system and things that happen much further like pulsars, cosmic magnetism. We also look at cosmic rays coming from far, far away. And we go all out to basically galaxy clusters and even the first stars that were born in the universe. Um, if I have to summarize that in one sentence, and I hope that if you click once, you will see that sentence. 
is that the range of low var is, please click, anything from the first stars formed 13 million years ago to yesterday's lightning on Earth and everything in between. Now, this one happens twice, so I would ask the, the, the host to click twice to go to the next slide, please. Yes, so how does the instrument look? Well, basically, LOVAR instrument consists of many, many antennas that are put on the ground uh, in, in several locations. Uh, there's two types of antennas, which we call the low band and the high band antennas, uh, which basically the low band is the low wavelength band, uh, no, the low frequency band. I always confuse the two. And the high band is the high frequency band. Uh, just for reference, the, the, the stuff that's in between is, is, is what is also well known as the FM band. So that's certainly not a band you want to do some radio astronomy observations in because you get you will measure a lot of humans and very little other stuff. Um, so what you see in the in the big image is basically the 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 what we call the core of the instrument. So that's most of the many antennas that are uh, concentrated in one location here in the Netherlands, in Ixlo, which is a very small village in the province of Drenthe. And uh, around there, there are several, uh, many remoter stations, which either look like the one on the bottom left, if they are in the Netherlands, or about 38 of those, or like the one in the middle, if they are abroad in Europe, abroad from our perspective. Of course, we are a European telescope. So. And if you look at the next slide, you'll actually see a map of where everything is. So here we see every every dot is basically a remote station, and and maybe also the local stations all have their own dots. I didn't count the dots whether they actually make sense in the Netherlands, but uh, this is mostly the international station, the international uh, uh, spread of the telescope. And by combining all the data of all these stations, and if you click, we probably can. I, I hope you'll get this one. Yes, then we can actually act as if we are a dish of about this size. So we are basically trying to, to get very nice images of the sky by combining very uh, signals from very far from each other. Okay, then the next slide, please. Now, of course, the stuff that gets more relevant to, to, to this actual talk is the data, data flow. So basically the first part of the data flow, which is not necessarily something that is completely relevant to the project, but is very important, is actually what happens if you start an observation. Well, the data has to go from the stations uh, which are, uh, in this case, a few remote stations. I, I put the lines in there. I, I, I want to explicitly mention that this uh, image does not show the networking topology because, well, of course, uh, it, it doesn't... Uh, it, whoops, where am I? It's not that straight. Um, but as it is shown in this image, all the remote stations, actually, the data gets uh, uh, collected or goes through Amsterdam and, and is collected in Groningen, which is actually the city I'm in right now, where the data is combined. After the combination, we will get the next slide. Um, we have actually the, the final data products and those go into what we call the long-term archive. Um, so basically we have 20 bit gigabit connections and the long-term archive is uh, distributed over three locations, one in Amsterdam, one in Jullie, one in Potsdam. Uh, well, serve in Amsterdam, the Jullich Supercompute Center in Jullich and the Potsdam Supercompute Center in Potsdam. Um, and uh, as you see, the amount of data that we generate that goes into the archive is on the order of seven petabytes a year. Now, sometimes we actually decide to start uh, compressing our data and it gets less. And then we, we decide to extend our correlator and it gets more again. So the seven petabytes a year is, is probably more or less the, 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 the standard number that we'll have. Uh, you see on the bottom right, you see the plots of where all the data is or has been during the duration of the instrument, actually. So you see the, the, the green part of the graph is, is, is all the data that's in Amsterdam. The red part of the graph, or whatever the color in the middle is, is the, the, the data that's in, uh, in, uh, in Jullie, and the blue part is what's in Potsdam. You can also see on the y-axis that we are uh, well, well over, or so, something over 50 petabytes in total. Next slide, please. So now the DIOS, the escape work. Um, so I think it's 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 probably relevant to mention that 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 in in the escape context, LoFAR is not an S3. I'm not even sure if it's an S3 at all, but that I not comment on that. But of course, SKA is 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 is, is formally an instrument that we are a prototype for SKA, and the cool thing is we actually have a running instrument. Um, so the goal of the uh, of the exercise is actually to look at our our actually our current workflow because that's an operational workflow and see how we would apply the data lake model to such a workflow and see how it would improve. 
So currently our data management is mostly in-house built. Uh, location info is mostly in the observational catalog. Uh, so I mean, the, the, the right also our, our, our um, archive is in that sense fairly static if the data is in, it's probably going to stay where it is. And so there's not very much automation also from where data from an observation go. So that's the current situation and wanted to see how we could support our workflow in this. So we defined a few use cases. And if you click, uh, I will show you the first use case that we defined. Uh, so this is the use case that we used for, for this DAC21 uh, process that was already presented by Ricardo of Richard. I don't even know who. Um, and so the first one is a very sim simple bread and butter ingest use case. You have data that's generated in Groningen and it needs to go to the archive. Uh, and then we added some life cycle in there. And the life cycle is basically all the LOFAR data in principle lives on tape because that's cheap and that will survive forever. And, uh, but of course the first week you probably want the, the astronomer who wrote the proposal to actually download the data. So you put it on disk and you leave it there for, for a while. I call that a week, but you can of course define that as any time. Um, on the other hand, one thing that we also wanted to test is actually for, for the copying of the data itself, our data tends to consist of relatively large files that sometimes breaks quite a lot of copy tooling. So we have some sort of tweet tooling that, that or tweet the tooling ourselves. So I, I think in the ideal world, we would like, want to use our own tooling. So we wanted actually to, to make sure we could put data in the data lake at the location and tell, then tell the system it's there, please handle it now. I have very little to report else on this use case than that we managed to, to, to put in this, 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 um, this workflow. So it was actually very nice to, 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 to go through this. And then the next slide, please. So yeah, then we had actually, we had a second use case, which was called data processing, but we could call it two use cases. So I call them 2A and 2B. Sorry for the confusion. And that's the data processing. So, so basically now assume that you have your data in there and, and, and you are a user or operations department and you want to take the data out of the archive and make an image out of it. So I try to illustrate on the right what happens when you try to observe a, a radio target, right? You have your target somewhere in the uh, in the universe, you observe it, and then the light goes through the Earth atmosphere, and the Earth atmosphere is a great thing because without it, we wouldn't have any radio astronomers to actually do the data analysis. But on the other hand, it's a bit annoying because it distorts your light. So what you do is basically you observe a calibrator source, you you solve the light paths for that one, and then you apply the 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 the, the, the corrections to the target that you're actually observing. Of course, reality is much more complex than this, but let's just ignore reality for, for, for a bit and just say this. Um, so the idea is you want to be able to somehow combine multiple observations, one of a calibrator, one of the targets in, in a sort of an observation package so that you can give people who want to do the processing basically, okay, you download this unit and then you get both data, all the data you actually need. If you go to the next slides, the, the, the way we tried to uh, implement that. So we took a real, real data from our archive and we put it somewhere in the data lake and we basically took uh, so every file here is one wavelength band of an observation so what we just did in this case is we took multiple files we put them together in a data set which which basically simulates an observation and we put these three data sets in a package this could for example be a thing where you have like i have two targets that are both very interesting and I have one calibrator run and i want to download everything at the same time so the idea was then we download everything through one command and one uh, logical name in the data lake, and then we do our processing. Um, and of course, we are a telescope, so I can show you what we actually did after that. Click, please. We, we made an image, haha. -ha. Um, I, 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 so I think that the, the important bit about this image is that, that right, we managed to have data on the data lake, be able to download it in a very simple and, 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 and practical way, do all the processing. I mean, the processing is not part of the, of the exercise, of course, in some way, but you know, it's nice that you actually do processing and have an image. Then the image was pushed back into the data lake. And then we go to use case 2B, I hope. Click. Yes. So the next step is now I am actually this user, this astronomer. And, and, and you know, the, this use case was very much targeted at, you know, look at the whole of the escape project. You, you have a, a science analysis platform that's being developed. There is the virtual observatory, which is basically the set of standards that make it easy to get data from well, basically any telescope, but, but especially in my case, telescopes that are not radio. And, and there is this data lake as a service notebook that Ricardo already mentioned. And that, that should make it easy for a normal user to actually take da query data uh, using the uh, science analysis platform, uh, 
and then put it in this, this notebook and combine data from multiple wavelengths to an image. So again, you, you know, the result of that exercise is really cool because it's an image. Yes, <laughs> you got the silent hint, thank you. Um, and so we have an image. So what we did is actually we took an image from the Hubble Space Telescope because the source that we imaged is, is a very, very well-known source in the radio, but it's not extremely uh, interesting in the optical. Uh, but we found a Hubble observation of it in the virtual observatory. And so the idea was that with very simple uh, actions in the notebook, as a, a, a basically acting as a, as a, as a more as a sort of non-expert user, we managed to make the image on the left, which is the LOFAR image that you already saw. And the white stuff is actually contours from the Hubble telescope. Next one, please. So, so that basically means, so I, I, I think based on, on, on this, the, the, so the automation of data placement and management has really potential for, of course, facilities with the distributed archive. I guess that's quite obvious because it's by design uh, designed for that. Uh, so we are actually continuing to investigate how, how, how we could be using this infrastructure for data management needs, taking into account uh, some of the things that, 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 that are already on our radar. I, I, I added a few of these that I could think of when making the slides, I have to be honest there. Um, one of them is, of course, how, how do you synchronize metadata between actually the catalog and the data lake? So we, we of course, we are an observatory, so we have an observational cat catalog and you have a data lake. And, Ideally, you want to have some sort of single ground source of truth. Uh, and also you could, I can imagine you apply rules actually based on data properties, things like public data, right? Both in, you know, how do I give everybody access to this data set as well as how do I do it easily? Of course, this is this data lake as a service plays a, a role there. Data embargoes, first year that we observe the data only goes to the person who did the request sec uh, from the second year on, it should become free. And of course, we are a prototype of FKA. We're involved in the SKA work. SKA is also doing some prototyping in there. So that, that's another stuff that, that I see happening. Next slide, please. Uh, last slide, actually, the ongoing efforts. So one of the things that I have been promising and, and threatening many people with that we, we are actually trying to set up our own ratio instance to, to, to experiment with. Uh, in the discussion last week or two weeks, I hope it's not. Some time ago in the in the in the DIOS workshop, there was a discussion that we may actually want to to see how we can collaborate on that also with our local uh, people. So it says maybe together with others, mostly for me to have a hook to 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 apologize to Mika for not having answered her email yet. It will it I will do it. Um, and of course, we have several data pro projects that 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 we can actually do the streams on. Uh, and for the rest, I think within the uh, escape uh, work, the stuff that's still remaining, I think the, the, the main uh, interesting focus also, given that we have the use case and that, and it looks really promising, is actually the integration between the, the work with, with the whole system. That was my last slide. Uh, so you hear uh, a lot of stuff. Obviously, this was um, uh, an overview. I invite you all uh, to... Um, to follow the links, all the links and the reference, the paper we published, uh, uh, as well as the presentation we gave into in international uh, international conferences uh, to hear about more many topics like uh, the monitoring uh, we uh, pioneered if you want in escape uh, as well as uh, the AI part was not fully covered. This is uh, into the paper uh, I linked. Uh, uh, can you please go back a few slides? Uh, still uh, up, up, up. Yeah, here, here you have all the references. Uh, so I invite you all to uh, to follow this to have a more uh, um, in depth view of uh, of what we have done in this uh, three years. Escape uh, will end this year, uh, end of this year. Uh, of course, the 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 next. Um, we have, as I mentioned, we have collaboration with other uh, European project that will uh, take escape legacy. Uh, so obviously some of the services, the data lake itself, uh, uh, we aim to, to have it uh, to stick around. It will stick around for, for, for a while. Um, and, um, and of course, I, I already answered a few questions uh, there's still time, let's say, to explore this uh, um, this concept of the data lake. You just uh, you have our contacts. You can write directly to us, 
and uh, and we can uh, surely follow up. Uh, there is one question um, from Philippe. Can the escape data lake be integrated with research data rep repositories providing access to data with persistent identifier? In principle, yes, but uh, there should be an effort, there should be uh, dev work to be done uh, for this integration between uh, Rusho, uh, so the data lake, and uh, external services. Uh, I would like just to point out that Rusho is itself um, um, is itself uh, um, um, uh, if you want insert in a certain sense is a meta data catalog meaning it, it keeps all the information of the data flowing around so if you want to integrate external data repository to have uh, also those metadata in, in, integrated in Rusho, this is additional effort and uh, and the uh, work should be uh, be performed to uh, to integrate this of course it can be done it's just a matter how and uh, uh, the effort that sh should be put um, should be put in uh, Rusho by itself uh, they are developing uh, uh, metadata functionality to cover not only HEP uh, use case but also astronomy um, astronomy use case uh, I leave uh, the floor also to Richard if he has something to add in the meantime uh, please uh, um, follow up in the Q&A um, chat or uh, by raising hands if you have uh, any other questions. Yes, thank you, Ricardo. And uh, thanks everybody for all the presentations. So just to complement a little bit uh, Ricardo's answer to Philip, uh, it is possible. Um, so Ursio internally uh, identifies data with what we call a DID data identifier and this is basically a pair of a scope and the name of the file or of the data set and so on so uh, your second question how how would this be in uh, continuous flows indeed as ricardo mentioned this would be a mapping that you would have to make externally let's say with timestamp as you mentioned or some other uh, some other convention and then you would need to make this mapping with the Russia scope name pair okay so the design on this would be on on the people who would develop this integration but uh, there is nothing technically or theoretically that uh, prevents this mapping and uh, handling this type of data with Russia and also ha ha having a persistent identifier the uh, ids inside Russia are anyway uh, unique so yeah you, you would have to make this mapping uh, from your external source. Uh, if there are no other question, I would just like to compliment, uh, now we mixed a little bit the Q&A with the closing remarks, but I would like to say that escape is indeed coming to an end, but it's not over yet. So there is still work on going on cloud resources. Uh, we are integrating S3 storages and um, Swift storages, and this needs to be consolidated. And by the end of the project, this will be consolidated. So this is something uh, to keep in mind for people who are interested to use also uh, in, um, commercial cloud resources in, in such a system. And we have, uh, uh, we are still consolidating token-based authentication with OpenID Connect. Uh, we have many services now that I, I am that I understand uh, that understand OpenID Connect, and we are consolidating the details so we can have um, a stable uh, a stable mechanism to authenticate new users. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> finally, I would say that the future of escape and the escape activities will be carried on uh, by communities who already contribute to uh, core technologies like Rusio. Uh, there are many members of the escape community who have contributed, who will contribute. Um, and uh, finally, that the escape core services uh, will probably be around more than escape, uh, maybe in a reduced uh, scale, but uh, they will be around to other European projects to be used by researchers and scientists and uh, people who participate in them. So I think that's also from my side. Uh, if there are no other questions, I guess I can thank you all and give the floor to Luigi, maybe.
Yeah, we invite you all to contact uh, us if uh, any question more uh, on the technical side, but also uh, if you have heard about the SCAFE for the first time today uh, with uh, both the emails I provided you in the chat, in the Q&A chat. Um, please, uh, I, I read from, uh, from Rita, all the presentation uh, uh, will be available uh, into the webpage. So, uh, please have a look at them because there's many reference to the uh, FDR and DAC, so the assessment challenge we have done, a lot of results from other communities, other experiments as well. Uh, it's, it's all there, all the references are there. Uh, please, again, contact us in case you need, uh, uh, you want to hear more or uh, you need uh, further details on, on some topic. And thank you all for attending, uh, attending this.